good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thank you very much indeed for joining us at this very important uh, panel session to discuss the role of artificial intelligence AI uh, and tackling uh, COVID-19. We've got a fantastic uh, panel of uh, experts to take us through some of the issues, uh, each of whom will speak for about six minutes, uh, after which I'll um, hand over and we will take some questions. So there are just some ground rules I need to run through. Firstly, for our speakers, uh, as I said, you've got about six minutes each. I hope that's uh, okay with each of you uh, and that you were aware of that. After about five and a half minutes, I'll just give you a, a quick nudge to remind you you've got 30 seconds. Um, when you're not speaking, uh, can I ask, encourage everyone to mute their, their microphones? Um, I think it will just make things easier. For our panelists, um, if you could, when I hand over to you, uh, just say your name and introduce yourself briefly as part of your presentation. I just need to remind everyone that we are recording this uh, uh, for uh, future use, so just be aware of that and that it is also being broadcast live. Um, if you, after we've taken the six contributions from our expert panel, uh, if you would like to ask a question, uh, please can you use the chat function, which you should find at the bottom of your screen, uh, type in there that you'd like to ask a question, preferably indicating whether it's a general question or it's going to a particular speaker, so that we know how to uh, handle those, because I think we possibly may have up to 200 people on here at some point, uh, and trying to spot who's waving at us may be difficult, so please use the chat function. Now, just before I get us going and hand over to our first speaker, who will be Professor Tim Spector, uh, uh, is there anything that I have missed, uh, either from uh, Desiree, who has been excellent in uh, organising this and putting together our expert panel, or from um, Bagita, who is from the Big Innovation Centre, who keeps us on the straight and narrow and uh, drives this very important uh, group forward. Zire, is there anything that I have missed? Um, no, just please write to the attendees. Uh, please write your questions into the chat and my colleague and I will queue you then and then you can ask questions personally um, in the end of the meeting. Excellent, thank you very much. Right, well, uh, in that case, I think we will uh, start. And I'm going to ask Professor Tim Spector to talk to us uh, for approximately six minutes. Tim, welcome. Hello everybody. Um, I'm going to give you a real life example rather than a theoretical one because uh, just over two weeks ago when my uh, department at King's College London was being closed down um, we decided to come up with an idea of how we could look at COVID using our skills uh, that we've been practicing using our twin database and so what we came up with is the idea is we wanted to work out getting an app in real time to quickly capture research participants and work out what symptoms they were having and track those over the next um, weeks and months to actually get a real picture of what was going on and link that to our other data. Uh, I went to a, a local um, a biotech company that we've been working with uh, who are uh, basically experts in data science and AI called Zoe Global and we've been doing work on nutrition together and they said, yes, let's do an app. Uh, the whole company would just shut down and, and work on that pro bono. And so in three and a half days, these guys produced an app that uh, we then uh, advertised on social media and got it out there. And amazingly, it went viral. And within 48 hours, we had a million people signed up downloading using it was the number one health app in the UK. And after two weeks, uh, we have 2 million, 2.1 million people as of today using this app and most of them are tracking every single day whether they have symptoms or not and what type of symptoms. And this has really been an amazing act of citizen science. We've appealed to the altruism of British people to do this and they effectively are creating a, a, a web of radar in, the, in their particular areas and to help the local NHS services, because we've come up with um, various maps that we can help the NHS with. It's also a way of documenting the symptoms that haven't been out there. Officially, you're only allowed to have COVID according to the 
uh, NHS and Public Health England guidelines, we have basically two symptoms, but we know there's at least a dozen that are important. And we highlighted one uh, lack of taste and smell that was the most specific one based on uh, one and a half uh, million people. So already we've uh, started to get uh, some results and we've done very well from all over the country. And if people are uh, in front of their laptops, they could go on to the website, which is called covidcovid.joinzoe, J-O-I-N-Z-O-E.com. And some of you have, uh, have taken over the screen. So if you could not share, that'd be fantastic. Um, I think it's uh, Maria um, Exenti. Um, uh, but uh, I'll carry on. Um, the, um, so what we found is that uh, we're getting data back from all of the country and we've produced these maps. And if you go to that website, um, the uh, covid.joinzoe.com, we're providing up-to-date maps of the country, which regions are most affected, which have uh, relatively little disease, and we've stratified these uh, in terms of um, the population base. And we have a really good generalizable view of 20 to 69 year olds across the country. We obviously don't get as many older people and people who are very sick uh, because it's app based. But we think this is an amazing tool that is already starting to give us answers. And uh, we haven't yet got any uh, official government backing or NHS backing, this is all done really on the basis of citizen science and driven by social media. Uh, but uh, because we're interacting with people, we're telling them what their results are, uh, they can see their local areas. And if you go to some of these maps, they're interactive and you can see exactly how many people in your um, district or your borough of London, for example, are reporting and what percentage are, the, are actually doing this. And every day we are exporting the data uh, in a secure way to the uh, NHS data repository uh, called HDR UK, Health Data Research UK, uh, and we have a, a data dump. And the idea is that can be shared with researchers and local NHS regions. And we're working with some of the, uh, uh, so all the NHS is getting the data. We're interacting well with um, some of the uh, key ones, particularly the Welsh and the Scottish uh, office have been particularly interested in our data. Um, some of these maps are showing hotspots. For example, we picked up the hotspot in South Wales very clearly. Um, and we also picked up areas like uh, Liverpool that have particularly high, high rates as other ones in the Midlands. Um, all this is done with uh, AI and we've now have our, we've put an algorithm with a data science team I've put all the symptoms we've got together, particularly this one on loss of taste and smell, which uh, until now hasn't been recognized by the government as a bona fide symptom. It's the most specific one in the 30,000 or so um, people that have reported it, who have and linking that with also with um, uh, positive viral tests. So putting this all together, we're, we're getting scores every day of a predicted COVID um, symptoms across the country and we think this is incredibly important data that is much is telling us two or three weeks ahead of time what the NHS is going to expect in the hospitals because these are early mild symptoms and we'd love to spread the word and everyone out there your important influencers to make sure to download the app yourselves and spread it uh, with friends and colleagues to get try and get up to five million so we get a, a true radar picture in every part of the country. I'll stop there. Tim, excellent. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Right. That's extraordinarily uh, rapid growth. Uh, Can I just uh, come in, Stephen? That would be really helpful. Um, uh, uh, Chris, um, have you come up as a result of your work and in a sense the, the sheer volume of data that you've generated, have you come up with a different uh, prediction to the imperial prediction, for instance. Has, have you actually been able to come up with a different uh, uh, set of uh, results? Well, we haven't done predictions 
based on deaths or hospital uh, admissions so far, um, because we, we at the present don't have adequate data on that. We've got data on how common this is in the population. And our estimates are that 1.9 million people currently have COVID in the UK. And that the numbers, um, and that's just in the, in the current two week interval. So probably there's another million before that. And there's probably uh, several million after that. And that's not counting the asymptomatic people. So we're hoping that once we link this with hospital data, and we're doing this in Wales because uh, that the, the Welsh office have been very helpful in, 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 in working with us, that we can then create these models and link it better. Because that's definitely, we want to be able to predict based on symptoms in any area, uh, who's likely to need hospital care. That's obviously the, one of the big things that's urgently needed by the NHS. So we can definitely do it. We just need uh, better data and, and a groups of people that are sicker and older just to get our models better. And thank you for everything you're doing. Um, you probably can't see it, but I've, I've got it on my phone and I'm religious every morning in clicking the button. Great. Well, it's good to have some support in, in, the, in the government. <laughs> no, anyway. everybody, everybody should, should have this, frankly. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed, uh, both teams. Um, right, we shall move on now to uh, Chris Harborn who is, uh, I think, Chris, your title is underneath your name. Uh, Chris, over to you, uh, six minutes. Great, okay, thanks so much, Stephen. Um, yeah, I too am uh, downloading and using Professor Spector's app, so good. Um, I'm here from um, Roche, um, who's kind of an interesting company in this area because we actually have a combination of different um, divisions. We have the farm division, um, which we've got some drugs which are yeah, in clinical trials at the moment for COVID-19. Um, we have a diagnostics division, um, one of the sort of the leading suppliers of the uh, testing toward the UK at the moment. But we're also a company who's made some recent strong investments within effectively data companies. Um, with the vision that we actually, by combining these three pillars together, we're going to be able to deliver stronger benefits to patients. Um, within Roche, I'm um, a statistician, primarily focused around clinical trials. But I'm also a member of what we call the RAN, which is our advanced analytics network, which tends to, tries to bring together the various AI, machine learning, data science skills across the whole company, giving an overview of what's going on um, within the whole company in this area. Um, so today, I guess there's four topics I'd just like them to really touch on. That's of data, uncertainty, appropriate methodology and collaboration. So data, um, is clearly sort of the, the underlying driver between AI and any modeling activities. And as such, it is a really important, valuable commodity in ensuring informed decision making. And the actual volume of data is one of the key properties of this, which clearly speaks to the importance of you know, continuing to increase the number of tests we're performing and ensuring this high reliability of tests that we will have. But it also there's aspects of design going into this. So clearly there's a lot of activity at the moment procuring the test in order to allow the real personal level decisions to be made for individuals. But once those have been met, there'll still be a continuing need for more testing to be occurring in a sort of systematic and the design testing way in order to really be able to inform the policy, inform the scientific questions around COVID-19. And this is one which I think we can get a lot more value on this by getting things in a much more structured manner than just sort of leaving it by chance. The other aspect of data I'd just like to call out has probably already been really sort of successfully demonstrated um, by Professor Spector. Um, but this concept of the also collecting the softer data, the symptoms reporting data, to get this overall picture of how the disease is progressing and integrating together. Second topic I'd like to touch on is uncertainty. So we're in a situation where we've got far more unknowns and knowns at the moment. Um, we've got data which is like to be sparse and it's gonna be subject to biases um, in all manner of ways, some which are gonna be non-obvious and not trivial to us. And so what we've got to be aware of is that any modeling process that we do, whether it be simple, whether it be complex, it's gonna be based on both implicit and explicit assumptions and creating uncertainty. So one of the key features from this is that when we come to communicate any outputs from any of our modeling exercises, any of our activities, we really ought to be reflecting the uncertainty around anything which we get from 
the fact that it's going to have some range of values which are plausible um, given the inputs that we've given. And this certainty should also be um, incorporated into the decision making process. Maybe not necessarily just taking an average value and average prediction decisions upon, but sort of thinking about what's a reasonable worst case. That could be a, a more informative measure in these situations. A third topic I'd just like to touch on is that of appropriate methodology. Um, I think, yeah, we have this inherent uncertainty and within AI, it's certainly been an area where I think there's been a, de a degree of hype and degree of overstatement at times. Now, certainly in some situations, um, complex AI type approaches can be the only solution for certain challenges like functional genomics. And certainly we've really seen the power of AI in what I call closed environments, you know, things like chess playing, go playing, where you've got a very clearly defined situation. However, it does require the risk, and we've seen this in the past, that actually some of the more black box models, some of the core com most complex models, have certain pro kind of problems with them. There's this risk of overfitting. Sometimes there can be this lack of generalizability. In a situation where you may have something moving rapidly over time, you know, it's evolving, the temperature is evolving, the, um, the virus itself may evolve it. An overfitted model may not be able to capture those differences and predict into the future as well as maybe a simpler model. There's also the question around the transparency and I think the importance that we need to be able to very clearly have confidence and credibility in any predictions that we make, um, which will make it easier to communicate, easy for decision makers to understand and easier for them to act upon. And in these situations, what I'd just be really making the plea is, you know, certainly we should be considering AI, we should be considering a whole range of different models, I think was alluded to earlier, and seeing if we can get what's the level of consensus between different models. But let's also consider the more established, the simpler models that we can have a little, that we maybe we know about their properties and we can have real confidence in how they're going to perform as well. The fourth topic I'd just like to cover is that of collaboration. So um, it's something I really feel in the AI community is the natural affiliation with collaborators. Um, hackathon type events are a real regular way of working. Um, this community has a real comfort with remote working, with collaborations tools. And so, yeah, you know, it's really good recently. We saw the Alan Turing Institute put out a call for, um, you know, volunteers to be incorporated recently. And even reflecting my own company, we put out a call for people to take part in a challenges. Then 48 hours, we've got 124 volunteers working across 24 teams, working on various internal and external challenges. So there's a real desire for people as well in this situation. And of course, one of the beauties of these type of events, this type of collaboration, is that they can leave a legacy. Um, well beyond the sort of the immediate pandemic, this is great learning opportunities for people, great opportunities for people to shape, share skills and to create a network really stick me in good stead going forward. So thanks very much for that. has been useful. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Pim, did you have uh, yeah, I, uh, Chris, thank you. I, I really just wanted to ask you, you're part of a, a multinational company and obviously you've been much in the spotlight over testing um, and the comparison with Germany and so on and so forth. Um, and I just wondered if um, uh, how much you collaborated really across borders with your colleagues in Germany and other um, parts of the continent, uh, indeed parts of the globe, uh, during a period like this. I mean, you talked about hackathons, but effectively you could have your own hackathon within Roche by itself, couldn't you? Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, I think very much it's the data the pharmaceutical industries are in international business. So, you know, on a, a daily basis, routinely, we're working with our colleagues. Yeah, they're typically based in, well, in Europe, in Basel and Switzerland, <laughs> over in uh, America as well. So basically, everything is taken as a global viewpoint um, within the company. So you're, um, kicking, you're kicking the tyres on the modelling uh, within the company as well as outside, basically. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And then how much do you reach out to people like like Tim? Um, I mean, I think, to, yeah, Tim, I must admit, we haven't spoken to before, but certainly sort of people like the Alan Turing Institute. These are people we've yeah, been working with for some time and yeah, we're trying to build a good relationship with them even further going forwards. 
um, you know, and people have, we've got connections with, yeah, all the academic, a lot of academic groups locally for the various different sites. So there is a community, basically. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. yeah really important. Mm. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Tim. And of course, thank you very much indeed, uh, Chris. Um, straight on, uh, I'm now going to go to Professor uh, Shannon Valla. Welcome, thank you. Um, please introduce yourself and you've got about six minutes. Uh, thanks for the uh, invitation to speak here today. Uh, my name is Shannon Valor. I'm the Bailey Gifford Chair in Ethics of Data and Artificial Intelligence at the University of Edinburgh, Edinburgh's Futures Institute. My research centers on the ethical design, development, and deployment of AI and other data-driven technologies with a special focus on shaping wise technology policy and responsible industry practice. I currently chair Scotland's Data Delivery Group, and I previously served as a visiting researcher and AI ethicist at Google. Uh, today, I want to speak about using AI to advance public health outcomes while engendering public trust. We know that public health measures, uh, especially by governments, are only effective with broad public cooperation and trust in government and health authorities. Yet we need to remember that AI use cases for surveillance and health faced a grave ethics and trust gap in the public mind before COVID-19. So this is the background against which uh, we are working. AI and other data-driven tools, as we've heard, can accelerate and amplify our public health efforts in a multitude of ways, from hotspot detection to contact tracing to patient risk assessment. However, many of these also carry substantial risks of unintended harm or abuse. Nor are these risks guaranteed to be balanced by the hoped for benefits. For instance, even Singapore's aggressive digital contract tracing campaign regrettably did not prevent a recent resurgence of the virus from contacts unable to be identified by the app, which reportedly did not gain even a third of the approximately 60% to 75% level of citizen adoption necessary to enable lasting suppression or containment. If the UK were to bypass ethical safeguards in a rush to deploy AI tools as aggressively and broadly as possible in the pandemic context, we would risk worse outcomes, not only from overconfidence and quick technical fixes, but by sparking distrust of public health authorities among the very communities we are trying to protect. This could well undermine the efficacy of all our public health efforts, not just those targeting COVID-19. More broadly, we're facing a critical test of the UK's ability to secure two increasingly fragile dimensions of civic health, trust in scientific and technical expertise and faith in the resilience and protection of democratic values in times of crisis. While private companies and non-governmental organizations must also take care to use AI tools responsibly in this pandemic, my remarks today are focused on AI deployments by or on behalf of public health or other government authorities. My recommendations for preserving public trust in such deployments are threefold. First, approval of new AI tools for government public health use that involves sensitive or high-risk data must be selective, evidence-based, and subject to a rapid feasibility, safety, and ethical risk analysis from an independent multidisciplinary team with expertise in identifying and safeguarding against technical and social failure modes of AI and other data-driven tools. Justifications for approved uses, recommendations for civic safeguards, such as privacy-preserving encryption, anonymization, decentralization or aggregation techniques, data deletion schedules, and strict access and use controls, judged fitting for the application and the need, as well as underlying risk assessments, should be open to public review and commentary. Health authorities should be required to disclose which tools are being adopted and where, how the recommended safeguards are being enacted, and who is accountable for their enforcement. Secondly, because any rapid approval mechanism will fail to identify or underestimate some harms, sensitive or risky deployments of AI or other data intensive tools should also be monitored by an independent oversight body empowered to gather evidence on the use and ongoing impact of these tools within the UK broadly and on particular groups and communities, especially the most vulnerable. 
This body should have authority to publicly recommend modifications or discontinuations of AI or other data intensive deployments determined to be insufficiently beneficial, no longer warranted by public health emergency, unjust in their effects on vulnerable populations, or otherwise detrimental to the public interest. Precedent for these functions can be found in the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board created in the United States after 9-11 to monitor federal anti-terrorism efforts. Finally, transparency and responsiveness to the public must be prioritized and given visibility. In addition to establishing independent approval and oversight mechanisms, public officials should maintain an open channel for citizens and public interest advocates to report abuse or unexpected harms linked to these tools, ask questions, or to publicly contest their use or seek remedy for unjust outcomes. Regularly scheduled government summaries of and responses to these inputs should be mandated. Government openness, accountability, and responsiveness to public criticism are not to be feared in a free society. They are its very lifeblood. Thank you. Shannon, thank you very much indeed. Uh, excellent contribution. Uh, Tim, did you want to come in? Yes, I, I, I would. Thank you very much indeed for that, Shannon. Um, really interesting because in a sense, you're uh, warning us about the use of data um, inappropriately during a pandemic. And of course, there was the joint um, civil society statement as well, uh, uh, which I think came out on the 2nd of April from all those civil society organizations, um, which said, uh, which was sort of headed, states use of digital surveillance technologies to fight pandemic must respect human rights. And that was a, a pretty large group of of people, but is there any evidence that actually um, uh, states, or, and particularly Western European states, are going uh, are in breach of the GDPR currently? Because surely, doesn't um, uh, health information which is relating to the pandemic isn't that um, uh, perfectly justifiably shared uh, under GDPR? A couple of things I would say. First of all, I would say that GDPR is a very important tool, uh, but GDPR does not capture everything that we care about with respect to human rights or responsible and ethical data use. So there are potential gaps where GDPR might not provide the kind of protection or may in some cases even uh, uh, mandate steps that would interfere uh, with urgent and ethically defensible goals that we have. So I don't want to denigrate the importance of GDPR, but I also don't want to treat that uh, as uh, uh, capturing everything uh, that I'm speaking uh, about that we have to preserve when we're talking about public trust. Um, yeah. Secondly, I, I don't think we have uh, evidence of uh, widespread uh, or uh, uh, acute harms uh, that are happening, uh, but I think it's too early to see that. Uh, and I do think we see a move uh, in some states uh, to set aside considerations of ethics and human rights uh, as a result of the uh, emergency state in which we find ourselves. And what we call something like, you know, lifeboat ethics, where all the other ethical considerations uh, other than survival are sort of thrown aside. Um, and, and I'm arguing that that would be a very short-sighted move and that we would in fact be undercutting our own broader public health goals uh, if we didn't uh, consider the need to demonstrate trustworthiness in our use of these tools. So I'm not advocating against the use of tools, even expanded use of some of these tools in certain areas. Uh, but what I'm saying is the more uh, risk that is involved uh, with those expansions, the more we have a responsibility uh, to demonstrate oversight and accountability mechanisms uh, to ensure that the public continue to support and cooperate with and follow the guidance of public health authorities who are using those tools. There's a strong trust element involved here. That's what it's about. If you look at the adoption of the app in Singapore, where broadly there is a considerable amount of trust uh, uh, and compliance with government, they still weren't able uh, to get voluntary compliance up where they needed it to be, even though uh, leaders were uh, publicly calling for uh, the public to voluntarily adopt the app. Uh, so the, the bar in many cases to get the level of public uh, um, support that you need for some of these initiatives uh, is immense. And, and you really need to appeal to them on moral grounds 
as a, as a trusted partner in, in public welfare. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Shannon and Tim. Um, I'm now going to go to our fourth speaker, which is uh, Dr. Richard Dabowski. Uh, Richard, are you there? I'm indeed, yes. Excellent. Um, if I could hand over to you to introduce yourself and then take about six minutes to uh, tell us your view on these issues. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, hello. Um, I'm uh, Richard Dabowski. I'm an AI researcher at uh, Cambridge University and I've actually been in the field of AI for uh, over 25 years. Um, the, pardon me, the main focus of my work uh, continues to be the application of AI to medicine, including infectious diseases, and also uh, to develop methods to support doctors' decision-making. Um, and furthermore, as my first degree was in chemistry, um, I've actually returned to the application of AI to chemistry, particularly where medicine and chemistry come together. Um, I'm currently involved with two research projects uh, in response to COVID-19. Uh, one of these is to do with policy optimization in the context of an epidemic, and the other is to do with drug-drug interactions uh, with respect to antiviral drugs. Um, given my background, background, I'd like to give evidence to two areas, although I'd like to also add something what Chris mentioned, which is very relevant. Uh, and the two areas, plus two, uh, uh, Chris's area, will be AI to support clinical decisions and also AI for drug discovery. Um, firstly, uh, the WHO listed the probability of various symptoms. So, for example, if a person has COVID-19, they have an 88% chance of having fever uh, or 68% chance of a persistent dry cough. But the converse is not the same. And uh, In fact, there's a very good, simple mathematical tool called Bayes' theorem. Uh, which is well known amongst uh, statisticians. And uh, this is a, that can be implemented in something called a Bayesian network. And this overcomes uh, a well known cognitive bias which clinicians uh, are, tend to be prone to. They can make incorrect probabilistic inferences, probabilistic assumptions. And the Bayesian network has been part of the AI toolkit for well over 25 years. So it's a very, very powerful technique. And that helps to bring together various features uh, in a sound probabilistic manner. And in fact, it was actually one of the people who were involved with it was actually David Spiegelwalter uh, over in Cambridge, and he was very instrumental in this very powerful technique. Um, looking at what's happening at the moment in the area, uh, there have been various initi initiatives to bring together evidence uh, of data and features for different sources. For example, there's been recently a joint US-Chinese uh, initiative to look at various machine learning techniques such as random forest support vector machines to try and predict how likely a person will have a particular um, uh, uh, respiratory disorder. The problem with that approach is that it requires evidence for all or values for all those features, uh, whereas a Bayesian network can handle a situation where only partial information is in fact available. So in that sense, it's extremely powerful. Um, another is as an Israeli company called Kahuna, who again put together what are called knowledge maps. They did this from uh, information available for something like whatever, 2,000 papers and articles. Uh, very helpful to bring that information together, but again, it doesn't do any probabilistic inferences. It's not really a Bayesian network. And I think it would be far better to publish all, bring all this information together into a single Bayesian network to help support clinical decision-making and risk assessment, uh, and to be able to predict a patient's severity to make well-informed decisions as well. I should also add this is a very transparent system and therefore it provides an, an idea of how, how a particular uh, conclusion was in fact obtained. Now, stick on the Bayesian side, I want to actually, uh, and if support is Chris's concern about the uncertainty of models. Uh, to date, we've had a model from uh, Neil Hilton, <coughs> but in fact, there can be, um, uh, other models could also be used on that, uh, on that data, and therefore have a range of models to give a better idea of model uncertainty. Uh, there's a formal way of called Bayesian uncertainty uh, modeling, but I think they'll give a fair idea of the uncertainty of uh, policies we actually are made based on those models rather than from a single model. So I very much uh, support what Chris is saying in that regard. Uh, the other area I want to touch on is the situation we have where we're told it could be 12, maybe 18 months before we have a vaccine available to us. And in the interim, we have to look at antiviral drugs. Now, there are various approaches to, in fact, uh, try and find these drugs. 
Well, I know there are various trials going at the moment, but it's still an ongoing search for further candidate antiviral drugs. Um, the techniques to use at the moment, again, looking recently at what's happening, is they tend to use fairly standard uh, software to try and predict what particular drug will uh, target a particular protein. In this case, a protein that's on the so-called spike protein that's to do with the coronavirus. Uh, there are far stronger AI-based techniques to do this, and I would strongly support the use of these techniques to support the current techniques which are actually being used. And I think it's important to do that, that is some kind of a coordinating group to bring these techniques together, maybe also for the various pharmaceutical companies, who I'm sure are trying to do part of this work, to bring their data forth. There should be a mandate to provide some kind of collaboration and bring these various techniques together for full discussion. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank Richard, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Tim. Yes, um, uh, thank you, Steve. Um, really interesting, Richard. Um, I think what you may need to do is gently take us by the hand. You referred to um, Bayesian, and I know that Shannon will have very much approve of that since they have a centre in Edinburgh named after him. No. Um, but I mean, you're, on the one hand, you seem to be talking about sharing more data. On the other, you have this uh, uh, more probabilistic approach, I think, by the sound of it, where um, uh, even if you don't have a great deal of data, you can you can infer from that uh, uh, with the techniques that you're talking about. And uh, absolutely. Which, and I'm, I'm slightly torn in understanding that because clearly we heard from Tim how uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, data which is now coming out of the COVID-19 app yeah. and so on, you know, uh, and we've got a lot more information now which the, the NHS has got and presumably that's being organised more effectively. Uh, than hitherto. So you, there is quite a lot of data out there. Why there, don't we there, there, be there is, sort of yeah. Bayesian about this? So okay, well, there, there's a lot of data, but there's also uncertainty associated with the data. For example, um, we have these various antibody tests uh, coming forth, but they're not 100% reliable. There's a certain percentage of that the, a, a test result could be positive or no, it could be a true negative. And to have a system that even allows that to be included in to make a final assessment about the severity of uh, a patient's condition will be immensely helpful. So it allows a means of bringing these uncertainties together in a sound approach. Great, thank you. Excellent, thank you, Tim. And uh, thank you again, uh, Richards. Right, um, our penultimate speaker will be James Kingston. James, are you there? <clears throat> Good afternoon, I am indeed here. Hello, James. Um, Hello. Introduce yourself and take approximately six minutes. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Uh, so my name is James Kingston. I'm Deputy Director of the Hat Lab, which is the innovation and uh, advocacy center of the hub of all things personal data account architecture, a system that is devoted to giving individuals uh, legal ownership and control of their personal data. Now, uh, obviously, there's quite a lot of things one could say about the uh, ways that artificial intelligence can be used in response to COVID-19. We've covered some of them, ranging from uh, particular algorithms to uh, matters of trust. I'd like to speak primarily to the nature of the uh, response, the civic response that's being created and the kinds of civic technologies that we might want to create and think about uh, in response to the uh, spread and then gathering social effects of this pandemic, with a particular emphasis on the, what Professor Valor raised, which is of course the matter of trust. Now, since this crisis first really began to bite, uh, we've seen this enormous response, uh, great waves of research collaboration, which the various professors here be uh, best equipped to speak to, but within our own world, um, within the hub of all things system has been very clear. We've seen, uh, for instance, um, new open research places such as uh, Just One Giant Lab, one of our partners, opening up uh, to facilitate designs of uh, algorithms and also applied hardware such as masks and ventilators. We've seen the applications such as Zoe, which of course we've talked about so much. And then we have had a uh, tech community and occasionally tech company-led initiatives such as hackathons, which have really swept the world. Uh, I tried to do a count of hackathons in the office recently and swiftly gave up. There's uh, multiple hackathons, some state-led, uh, as the case in Poland and Estonia, and I think also Sweden too, and then others on Meetup, uh, really, really proliferating. 
And this, I think, shows uh, the extent to which the tech community and research community uh, wants to contribute and to feel empowered. But there is something lacking, um, I fear, and that is this matter of trust and empowerment. Artificial intelligence, particularly when used in its um, epidemiological aspect, uh, in its public health matters in terms of tracing uh, the virus and, and prompting behaviours to counter its flow, requires a great deal of public trust. And it requires that the public feel empowered uh, to do things about it. Our worry in the hub of all things system is that in the haste to respond uh, to the crisis at hand, that this has been somewhat lost, uh, both in this particular state and in many other places around the world, uh, particularly, of course, uh, in East Asia, with the Chinese examples often foremost in people's mind. Our vision for uh, the response is really centered around civic technology, which is to say technological forms that really empower individuals and communities to fight the virus on their own terms. So with that in mind, and we mentioned uh, this, my own presentation, the previous one, uh, all the hackathons that have happened, we set up our own hackathon called Hack From Home, uh, which actually was uh, conducted over the last weekend and concluded last night with the, the final submissions, which was all focused in on what we saw as the three strains uh, of, of work. The first is citizen science, uh, a term we've heard a, bit, a little bit of today, which we saw as really empowering individuals to contribute their personal data, rather like, of course, the Zoe uh, application we've mentioned. The second is care in the community, which is empowering individuals and then leaders within the individuals to make sure that in the absence, uh, with or without the state and governmental authorities, that vulnerable people can be cared for uh, using personal data to help you know, triage uh, care and, and their needs. And the third is mass coordination, which is enabling applications that will enable people to uh, adjust their behavior to whatever the needs might be of the day. We saw this as particularly relevant in uh, enabling the, the loosening uh, approach where people could start going back to work rather than just being under lockdown. Central to all of this is the idea that what would be most useful is for individuals to be able to see their own data, to be able to store it and to contribute it of their own violation to governments or to companies that are conducting that data analysis. Since launching our hackathon idea, uh, no more than about two and a half, three weeks ago, uh, we had a truly enormous response, uh, 800 people attending with 26 different projects, three of which in particular uh, were showed, I think, the ability of artificial intelligence researchers to make rapid progress in this time of need. We had a, uh, a project called Reuse Drugs uh, being created over the weekend. Uh, which was designed to look at chemical compounds that had already been created and licensed and to assess them to see if they were useful for COVID-19. They found three and they submitted it to a lab for test on the space of 48 hours. We found there was a, a particular project that created a, a public health system uh, using agent-based modeling for refugee camps to suggest how refugee camp leaders uh, may best structure, uh, in particular food distribution and medicine distribution, to minimize the spread of the disease in camps where often the population density is two or three times higher than that in the famous uh, plague ship the princess diamond um, so it's you know a huge problem there and in the third i think in many respects most um, germane to this particular discussion is the uh, health traffic light application which is an application designed to uh, combine people's location data with their social data in order to give them uh, privacy respecting risk scores for who they come into contact with. It's that privacy respecting element we see is uh, particularly important here. People are being asked to do a great deal and to sacrifice a great deal. And at the same time, we already have beginning in the press, the worries that we're going to be creating patterns of data governance and state control that simply won't go away. Rather, of course, uh, akin to uh, the whole new wave of controls that came after 9-11, which I believe was mentioned uh, earlier in this presentation. GDPR can't do that alone. There needs to be a, information, a governance system that provides that. And our strong recommendation would be that leaders think first and foremost about the tools, trust and governance that will enable uh, the public to want to buy in to the me measures that are needed. And I think I went slightly over, so I, I beg your forgiveness, but uh, there we are. That, that's fine. Thank you very much uh, for that. Um, a lot of uh, good information in there. Tim. James, yeah, I just really wanted to follow up because you know, it could be argued that, especially during a pandemic, um, 
the one thing you don't want to do is uh, over limit the sharing of data, i.e. go beyond GDPR in terms of uh, these uh, mechanisms like hub of all things and so on, where people do not share uh, this kind of health information. On the other hand, some people would say that the most sensitive information you can possibly generate is health information. But how do you how do you reconcile those two views? Because you know certainly, if you were sitting in the chair of the uh, of Secretary of State for Health, you'd want to be able um, to have uh, 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 I mean depersonalized perhaps, but cert or anonymized. But you would certainly want the uh, Department of Health and the NHS to have the broadest possible access to that kind of health information, wouldn't you? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think there's there's varying levels of, of response. You know, we have the question of fighting the virus and its spread right now. And then we have the question of um, fighting its noxious social effects uh, in a sort of, you know, the, the weeks that, that come ahead. We'd say a few things. Firstly, in all events, there's a value to people um, being able to uh, own and control their own data and being empowered with that, having that relationship to the data that has been generated by them. And we think that's valuable uh, in and of itself. The second is, is that using that particular architecture and you know, other architectures, there's ways of uh, providing inferences and, and minimizing the amount of data that is needed, um, both uh, in terms of then data that's aggregated by central authorities that want to, uh, to monitor it, or if the application is just simply attempting to provide information to, to one's neighbors. There's, there's ways I would suggest that any, well, not even suggest, I would state, there are ways of building these things uh, so as to minimize uh, the amount of data uh, that, or, well, deeply identifiable data that has to go forth uh, elsewhere. Thank you. And just, just to be clear on that, this particular hub of all things architecture does enable that with uh, internal computational devices. Uh, that provide inferences about the uh, the core data going going elsewhere. James, thank you very much indeed, and thank you, Tim. Uh, right, and on to our uh, final presentation, which is from Adam Riccoboni. I think that's the right uh, pronunciation. Adam, you're there. Yes, I am. Adam, thank you. Yes, quick from six minutes. Uh, Hello, I'm Adam Riccoboni, the CEO of Critical Future, a company with a track record of developing new AI solutions, including in healthcare. And I'm also the author of the book, The AI Age. I'm going to talk about how AI can help fight COVID-19 and also prevent future epidemics. But first, I want us to travel back a few years to 2016. This is the year the British-founded company, DupeMind, based in London, used AI to beat the world champion at the ancient Chinese game of Go. And this British founded company being crowned world champion at the ultimate Chinese strategy game of Go gave China a Sputnik moment, mirroring the frenzy of investment and activity of the US in a space race following Russia's launch of the Sputnik satellite, China became determined to lead the world in AI. And from 2017, China began investing billions in AI research with an explicit government strategy of becoming the preeminent AI nation by 2030. Now today in 2020, we can already see the fruits of that strategy, as China and other countries in Asia have effectively used AI against the global pandemic of COVID-19. And I hope this striking example of Asia using AI to manage a healthcare and economic crisis gives us in Britain our own Sputnik moment, our own AI moment, and puts rocket fuel in our ambition to become a preeminent AI nation. Now, AI can help fight against COVID-19 and prevent future epidemics in five main ways. The first way is from containment. For example, a mobile phone app in China called Alipay Health Code operates a traffic-like system which determines who can be quarantined and who can go out. I know there's been a lot of uh, very valid points about safeguarding privacy made today, but that can be done. For example, MIT have an app called Safe Paths which uses GPS data for containment, but importantly safeguards privacy and actually has a charter of human rights. I spoke to Safe Paths in preparation for this meeting and their app is fully available for rollout in the UK and is free at the moment. Um, another option for fighting um, COVID-19 with AI is detection. 
in China, smart helmets and cameras detect fever among people in public places. And there are AI diagnostic tools for chest radiology scans in China and South Korea and Canada. And Tim um, Spector, Professor Tim Spector has a fantastic tool here also being used for detection. Uh, the third area is in drug discovery. AI can identify suitable viral therapies and Gero in South Korea has already used their AI platform to identify existing drugs which can be repurposed for COVID-19. The fourth area is in patient care. For example, China has donated nurse robots to Italy which can monitor key parameters of patients and reduce human to human transition. Also AI triage platforms like Vital in the US with their coronavirus checker can re reduce the burden on frontline healthcare systems. And finally, AI can be used to predict future epidemics. A company in Canada called Blue Dot used AI to send an alert, an early warning system about COVID-19 in December 2019. I interviewed Blue Dot in preparation for this meeting, and actually their system is human plus machine. The AI was used to process vast amounts of media data, find a needle in a haystack, and a, a team of human physicians identified correctly that COVID-19 was a threat. Um, I think in the UK, we can develop a far better AI prediction engine, but we need access to the right data. So what do we need from Parliament to apply and leverage and exploit all these immensely useful AI technologies in Britain? Well, the first thing we need is government leadership. Um, in 1918, the Spanish influenza pandemic led directly to the creation of the Ministry of Health. The early, this early 20th century viral pandemic showed that the UK's healthcare system needed better organization. Today, in the 21st century, the lesson to be learned from the COVID-19 crisis is the UK's healthcare system needs better technology, specifically better AI. Therefore, I propose that AI is put to the top of the political agenda an AI department um, parent, um, mirroring the AI health ministry may be too much, but certainly you can help us with some of the key things we need in the AI community. The first being access to data. Uh, I know there's a lot of concerns about um, privacy and safeguarding, uh, which I think can be taken into account with systems like SafePath, which I mentioned earlier. What we AI developers need is access to more data. We need the government to help persuade the public to provide data in safe ways. We need um, partnerships with private sector, perhaps being mandated to share drug discovery data, which can be used for biotech. And we need more access to live NHS healthcare data as well. Um, and I just want to end by you know, posing the question, could Britain really be a world leader in AI, could we compete with giant countries like China and the US? And I think the answer is absolutely yes, we can. Artificial intelligence is an American term, but it was the British genius Alan Turing who invented the field. Um, and it was Turing who did pioneering work on what he called thinking machines and provided a blueprint for machine learning. It was also the British innovator, Geoffrey Hinton, who made the key breakthroughs which made deep learning such a powerful technology. And it was the British Demi Hassabi I mentioned earlier who gave China their Sputnik moment. So Britain has contributed as much to AI as any country in the world. We can see that from the quality of the speakers today. And we can lead the world in AI with a parliamentary ambition to match our potential. And the last point I want to make is that, um, that will not only help us in healthcare, but also economically. You know, McKinsey's done independent research which shows that AI can increase the UK's GDP by 22% up to 2030. And that will be sorely needed as we come out of this lockdown and this COVID-19 crisis. Thank you very much for your time. Adam, thank you very much indeed. Um, excellent. Now, with an eye on the clock and recognition, so sorry, Adam, thank you for that. I'm gonna ask Tim to come in in a moment, um, but we are- Shall I just have a, it's only a very quick one, this one, Stephen, okay. uh, and then we can get on with the Q and A. Um, really, just, just, <laughs> uh, just to Adam. I mean, it's, do you think there is beginning to be um, uh, a sort of division in terms of the way that people look on the use of data? You've really uh, emphasised the importance of that and how we can be internationally competitive. But are you, are you concerned uh, about access to data as we are currently in the middle of this pandemic? Yes, yes. certainly from an AI development perspective, we need access to more data. 
for example, we, if we had access to live healthcare data from the NHS, we could build fantastic AI solutions. Also from a biotech perspective, we need more access to um, the drug company's data, perhaps mandating them to share more in the public interest, and then a, a campaign to persuade the public to share their data. From the public's perspective, being on lockdown, giving up all of your you know, um, freedoms um, is, is possibly far worse than sharing some of your, your mobile phone data, you know, knowing that there are privacy safeguards there. So I think that the public can be persuaded if we have parliamentary leadership on it. Well, I think we have a bit of a debate here, don't we? Excellent. Uh, thank you, Tim, and thank you again, Adam. Right. Um, just before, uh, well, I suppose first of all I should say is, do any of the panelists, the speakers, have any questions for any of the other speakers or points of clarification they would like to make? If not, no. go on. I have some, some general points I'd like to make. Um, uh, in particular address to the question of safe pass and, uh, and, and that sort of thing, if I may? Uh, yeah, if you can try and keep them brief though, because we're running out of time, obviously. But Yes, absolutely. So I think um, th there's a few points here. Ultimately, governments can gather a lot of data. Governments can do what they like with data if they make it so. Uh, the question of who has data and who does what of that data really comes back down to power. The person who gathers all that data acquires a great deal of power. In the long run, uh, uh, as a government and legislature that wants to support the um, individual power of individuals, uh, which we have always presumed as being the best for the health of democracy, does need to make sure that individuals have that power. And if data is power, then individuals must host that data. The example of SafePass, MIT collects all that data. If you want to get the data out of MIT, which is and they're apparently privacy preserving app, you have to ask them. There's no portability. What's needed are tools that give people their data in ways they can flow it into and it's portable so they can make the choices they need to on it. Apps like SafePass can't provide that. Okay, great. Now, I could go on, but I'm, I'm aware of the time. <laughs> well, we'd love to hear you go on, but the problem is time is always the enemy of these. <laughs> um, okay, I'd now like to go to briefly to David Bray, if I may, Dr. David Bray. Uh, are you there, David? Yes, uh, greetings, thank you. Um, well, thank you again to all the panelists for the uh, very interesting remarks. Um, real quick, I'm at the Atlantic Council's Geotech Center that looks at the geopolitics of data and technology. Um, in a past life, was involved with the response to 9-11, anthrax in 2001, SARS and West Nile. The, the, the question, but also the premise I would present to you all is the only way through this crisis is through it together. And so recognizing that obviously this was from a UK centric perspective, I would say if you're only looking at UK data, then you're waiting until it comes to your shores. We have to figure out a way to work across countries. We have to figure out a way to work across sectors, not just with the immediate response. And in fact, we actually are looking at the different data sets that are coming in across countries. Some countries are intentionally biasing their data sets. Um, surprise, surprise. Some sectors are unknowingly biasing their data sets. And so while I appreciate this is a focus on AI, if the data is garbage, then the conclusions will be garbage too. So I raise that because I think there's a huge opportunity and I think it's something that we should consider about how do we work across sectors and nations, both for the immediate response to try and figure out which tests with specificity and sensitivity are working the best, which therapies are working the best, and is the virus mutating? And are actually, are we seeing multiple strains going across the country that we're trying, uh, the world that we're thinking is just one? And then two, the global recovery will only happen if we start working across data questions now to figure out what is the right way to re be the, rebuild the economy. So I raise that saying, what can we do to do together? Because that's the only way through this crisis. Okay, great, thank you. Would anyone like to pick up on any of those points? And uh, well. David, please, by all means, join our next international global hackathon. We had uh, people from all over the world participating in sharing data. You'd be very welcome to come. Yes, so we actually have been doing some ourselves too. The challenge you've got is it only works if you actually address the fact that governments are intentionally, in some cases, giving you biased data for hackathons. Okay, great. Anyone else want to pick up on any Points. I think that's a very good point about data sharing and we absolutely should share data internationally uh, and work with the um, United States and any other countries we can if to solve these problems together. Okay, thank you Adam. 
and it certainly sort of speaks to a data standardization. So, you know, that can be comparable and you're looking at comparing apples with apples instead of apples with oranges. Um, and it's actually an also a very interesting comparison, actually, of the different strategies which different countries are adopting. Um, and effectively, you've got a little bit, it's not a randomized experiment, it's an experiment going on um, to see how those different policies play out. Yeah. Thank you. In, in that context, uh, so I'm Birgit Anderson from Big Innovation Centre. In that context, uh, I would like to ask the panel if they on balance things that these very strong authority regimes using AI and data from AI versus more like open democratic uh, kind of app, uh, regimes, which one you, they think would be the most successful ones? Because there we see that in, in, in actually combating the, uh, the spread or the pandemic, we see countries here have completely different strategies. So is, is it really about strong authority uh, that can apply AI uh, or is it more a matter of like the community uh, to apps that they can apply AI? Which one would be the most successful one? Uh, that's one, one question. The other question on data use is that to be completely uh, uh, you know, blunt, right now in Italy, uh, uh, they have had the issue uh, and it's also emerging in the UK that there's not a lot of ventilators. So the doctors have to make the decision on who should actually have the ventilators. Uh, who should, could, should AI be used in these decisions to help doctors to decide the, the distribution of ventilators? Uh, or to what role should AI or could AI play in this at the moment? Uh, and then uh, uh, the last thing I want to come into all the research now uh, is uh, we hear uh, uh, on the news about how computers are connected across researchers and organizations to solve the problem uh, of uh, uh, COVID-19 and find a, a cure. But we have to also remember that the European Union previously in the major framework programs, when they connected lots of uh, organizations to solve one problem, they got very biased uh, in the results and they started to work with lots of smaller groups. So how will we actually do we think that at the moment we need to just connect all computers or are there any kind of ways in which we can work with alternative solutions so we don't, the rate and direction is, is not all in one way? Brigitte, thank you. Um, who would like to try and pick up on some of those? Tim, I saw you trying to get in earlier. Did you, uh, Tim Spector, sorry. Did you want to come back? Um, I'm just saying that um, we are in a consortium globally of, of other uh, countries who are already collecting um, COVID symptom data uh, and uh, you know by getting a consortium together of many countries I think you can nullify the data from some biased countries and I think that's the best weapon is basically collecting more more data not relying on one 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 particular country you can get a much uh, truer picture of what's going on so I think there's always be those biased data, but I mean, at the moment, if you collect it from individuals, you're probably getting less biased data than just collecting uh, death uh, percentages, uh, which is currently being used as political tools. So it, I think the more we can collect large numbers of data, get up into the millions, it becomes more representative of what's really going on. And we can see, for example, fairly quickly, we've got launched the same app in the US, so we can see whether these symptoms these 12 symptoms that go with COVID are the same in the US as in the UK, uh, which will tell us whether it's another strain is exactly the same or um, there's a different level of reporting due to culture. So I, I think the more data you've got, the more you can solve these problems. Excellent, thank you. Um, anyone else wanted to address? I just wanted users? to jump in uh, briefly um, on both of the, the last a few speakers' comments, which I think point to the issue that data quanti uh, quantity is not uh, a substitute for data quality. And we often, uh, in an emergency, uh, think that the, the goal simply is to gather more data from more places, uh, which we do need to do. But I think we have to really have experts who understand where the biases in the data are and how they can be uh, mitigated or neutralized. So in many cases, for example, if we know the biased 
we can often find a secondary source of data as a cross check uh, that gives us an estimate of how biased that data is and allows us to adjust our estimates. So we need a much more sophisticated approach than just the sort of grabbing and hoarding of data indiscriminately. And that means you need people with the expertise, not just in how AI and data science works, uh, but how it fails or how it gives misleading results when fed uh, unreliable or uh, skewed data. Uh, hi, this is Richard Bosky, um, and I absolutely agree. I think uh, it has to be a far more sophisticated approach. You can't just simply combine a lot of data together, which could be from a very wide group of uh, subpopulations and being heavily biased. And I think one way of trying to perhaps see if that's the case is to look at what models are being produced by different types of data and see what the variability is of those models. Therefore, if a lot of models give or different data sources give a similar result, then tends to give a slightly more confident, a greater degree of confidence than a widely spread uh, uh, conclusions. I think that's perhaps one way forward. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, now, obviously we've gone over 6.30, but uh, are all the panelists happy to stay on the line for a little bit longer uh, if we have some questions from our wider audience or uh, do any of you need to go? I have, I've got another call, I'm afraid I have to be going on to. Okay, um, I completely understand that, Tim. We did say 6.30, so uh, if you want to leave us, or stay and just drop out whenever you feel like. Okay, well done. People can email, email me if they've got any specific questions, as, as the rest of the world seems to be at the moment. Absolutely. And thank, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much. You're doing great work. Great Brilliant. work. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Okay, um, I'm now going to pass over to Desiree, who I think has some questions marshaled. Ready yes. for Laurence Moroni? Yes. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes, well, good morning from Seattle. Um, unfortunately, the, my question was for Professor Spector, who has just left, but um, I'll, I'll leave it out for everybody. It was that I think he's done an amazing job with that app. Um, I think to be able to bring citizen science into it for the diversity of data gathering sources is amazing. And my question and encouragement was for the app to be open sourced so that superpowers such as the UK and the US, who now have access to the app, and I believe he mentioned it's also available in Sweden, but maybe some other countries and some poorer countries may be able to build a similar network um, without the level of support you have in the UK and we have in the US. So I just wanted to encourage that to be open sourced. Excellent. Um, as uh, Tim said just before he signed off, um, feel free to email him. So I would suggest that you email him that and uh, uh, yeah. have that discussion directly. But thank Will you. Will do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Desiree, next uh, question. The next question is from David Wood. David, are you there? Yes, hello. Uh, thanks very much for putting this together. My first comment is on process. I think we could be more collectively intelligent by taking the questions which have been voted for most by the audience rather than just whoever happened to put the questions in first. Then we can uh, draw more on the collective intelligence of what's a very bright group. The question I do want to ask is the question I do want to ask is about uh, privacy. Uh, the questions have all, many people have said, "Oh, uh, there are risks with privacy. Oh, there are risks with bias. Oh, we've got to be so careful here." But isn't uh, the opposite uh, uh, issue? The issue is that we might be deterred by these issues about risk and privacy, and we might not go fast enough. We might delay in uh, accelerating solutions. We are in extraordinary times. We are making many sacrifices with the lockdown. Other sacrifices may be needed. So my question for the panelists is where do they sit on this? Do they say, no, the traditional rules on privacy and bias are paramount and that we just have to fight hard? Uh, we shouldn't be adopting AI unless it's 100% proven? Or do they say instead that we should be willing to be more flexible here? Uh, or do they say, finally, that we should be accelerating in towards federated learning, decentralized ownership. After all, there are groups such as Andrew Trask, a young researcher in Oxford, who is said by some to be the world expert on some of this decentralized data ownership. Should we be accelerating that above everything else? David, thank you for that question. Um, <coughs> a very good point. Who would like to try and address that? 
I, I can jump in briefly and just say, I think it's important not to paint uh, this as a uh, false dichotomy between uh, being effective uh, and timely in our response to the pandemic uh, and being trustworthy and responsible. Uh, these are not alternatives. These are actually part of the same equation. So my argument is not that we uh, blindly adhere to uh, privacy considerations that would in fact impede us from saving millions of lives, uh, but rather we think about how behaving in a way which is demonstrably uh, respectful of human rights and considerate of the risks uh, is likely to allow us in fact to get the levels of public cooperation uh, uh, as well as um, trust in uh, public health guidance that are necessary to save lives with the data that we gather. Uh, so the uh, argument is, uh, is, is well positioned in, in this sense, right? If the government were to be too afraid to act uh, and were to do nothing simply as a result of uh, 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 being afraid to tread uh, uh, on, uh, in, a, in a risky area and as a result failed to uh, suppress the pandemic effectively, that would of course undermine public trust. Uh, what I'm arguing is that public trust has to be part of our and central to our approach, uh, not that we uh, simply adhere to privacy for privacy's sake, but we think about what are the privacy considerations that are required to act in a way that earns uh, the public trust as, as stewards of public health. I, I just wanted to come in. I, um, I agree with the questioner. I think we do need to move faster, not just to tackle COVID-19 now, but to prevent future epidemics. We need uh, more data to prevent future epidemics. And I think the public would be willing to give it up with safeguards in place, as long as there was a communication strategy with them from government about why we need this to prevent this ever happening again. If I may um, speak to those, those points as well. Uh, so we, re we mentioned decentralized data ownership. I mean, yes. I agree with Professor Valla. It, it's not a, um, it's a false dichotomy. We can have AI. Uh, I would certainly support, and the rest of the HAT ecosystem would certainly support these AI, but it's all about decentralized ownership. You know, just giving up your data to some um, possibly uh, completely unaccountable or less and less accountable central body uh, with no long term knowledge of, of how it might be used, um, uh, excellent comms campaign or otherwise, uh, 10 years hence. Um, that's a recipe for you know some yeah. very different power structures in society. I think with new techniques, new data architectures, new forms of AI such as federated learning, you know we can have AI and we can do it in a way that respects the autonomy uh, and privacy and freedom of individuals. Yeah, I mean I think in this situation I think one of the things is communication is key, and a lot of the concepts we're talking about here are actually very difficult things to communicate. So how we put those across is going to be a real challenge. Um, I guess we also have to think about this because there's immediately there's this immediate short term situation, but there's a long term situation as well. You know, and what we've got to affect in any war, you've got to win the peace following it. Um, you know, so we don't need to do anything which is going to destroy the peace you know, in the long term to destroy this trust, which is actually going to end up in a worse situation at the right time. So it's a very fine line which does need to be trodden here. And clearly it's an evolving situation. I think the attitudes of culture of society as a whole um, is changing with these all the time. You know, we see this even over, and this is much bigger than just healthcare even. You know, the idea of what's being put on Facebook, um, you know, 20 years ago, people would never put that degree of their lives up there. You know, after people are. No. Thank you very much. They certainly did not. Um, Sorry, this is a mission. <laughs> Can I just very quickly uh, add something to that? I totally agree with what um, uh, James has said, and I would even propose that there should be some type of group put together to think how that can be actually uh, um, taken forward. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, Desiree, perhaps one, well, another question, and we'll see how we go do on time. Yeah, um, it's Tangi Morgan. Tangi, are you there? Hey, Tangi. Tangi, sorry. Uh, my question was really um, on the back of Professor Valor's comments around trust and transparency. Um, and just wonder um, her thoughts uh, taking that, um, you know, those 
topics, if you will, relative to the app that Professor uh, or Dr. Spector um, has, you know, um, um, I guess you'd say set out um, because it, it, it was a, it is a quick uh, way to try and gather information, obviously, but taking um, the areas of trust and transparency and the data that's being amassed. I was curious about her comments on that. Yeah, I mean, I think we have to um, take each tool or application on a case by case basis. And as I as I recommended earlier, uh, I think if these tools particularly are going to be used by uh, government authorities or in ways that increase the power uh, and uh, control of public authorities, then I think we absolutely need to do a rapid but uh, effective risk analysis on individual tools. I do think we have to recognize, however, that the risk is not equal. If we are talking about, for example, um, symptom uh, reporting um, that is uh, aggregated and uh, shared only uh, with respect to relatively large geographic regions, uh, that presents a much less acute risk of abuse uh, than uh, individualized uh, diagnostic uh, results uh, or uh, 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 cell phone uh, uh, tracked uh, movements uh, over the course of two weeks uh, down to uh, the, the level of, of a couple of meters, right? That's a far more acute, uh, uh, acutely risky piece of information. It doesn't mean we shouldn't have it, uh, but it means we have to take much more care uh, to think about uh, how we uh, protect that information uh, to ensure that it's not used uh, inappropriately uh, or uh, uh, disclosed uh, to uh, people who would use it for purposes other than uh, protecting public health. Uh, and I think, you know, if you look, for example, uh, uh, at the case of Poland, uh, who uh, has proposed a very aggressive data gathering strategy and then proposed holding on to that information for, I believe, six years, Right. Um, that strikes me as something that is at this point um, unwarranted. Uh, and if, for example, it turns out that we need to hold this information for six years, that would be something we may learn as we go. Uh, but it, it's, it's quite alarming to have a government say, we're going to gather this very high risk information and we're going to hold it uh, for uh, well beyond what the projected uh, period of this pandemic emergency is. Um, that would rightly give many people pause and perhaps inhibit them from sharing accurate information in a timely manner with the government. So I just think we have to be very careful to assess the risks relative to the need uh, and uh, the potential of the tool uh, to help us. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, I suppose we have. Do we have any final questions, uh, Desiree? We have one last question from Christine Show. Christine, are you there? And you can be our last questioner. Yes, hi, this is Christine here. Hi, this is Christine here, can you hear me? Yes, I can. So, uh, Great, I, I raised a question on digital identity, which I think that has been some discussion amongst um, companies already in the UK. I just wonder if that can be integrated into the discussion of um, of, of personal information, because we're talking about the digital attrib attributes of, of the individuals. Um, so I think this is a broader discussion on, on, on what can we leverage on the existing initiatives that have been in discussion amongst maybe banks, maybe other tech companies that's already going on. Um, I actually have a follow-up um, uh, a question related to the information on the traffic light system, because I found it very interesting, because personally I'm ethnically Chinese, and seeing that happening as a discussion, uh, as something as a, what is now being considered as a as a good practice of uh, for the uh, in the name of uh, public health crisis management in China, and the fact that the UK or Germany are considering it is a very interesting development, because of the fact that to a certain extent it, it does scares me a little bit in the sense that I'll be rated without me potentially having the ability to um, challenge how I'm being rated and, and how the, the, the algorithms or the data are being collected. So I wonder if anyone could respond to, to me on um, if, if, if any individual who is concerned about this traffic light system, how transparent it is, 
can individuals uh, provide additional information if we are not getting the rating that we wanted? How can that be managed? Thank you. Yeah. But, but just make a point on that. I, I think the alternative to this um, traffic light system, the targeted approach, is a blanket lockdown, and that's what we've got in the UK. You know, we are literally almost under house arrest. We're only allowed to leave our homes for exercise and for essential shopping. If the government can be more targeted using AI and just specifically target those people who, who are infected or who have been in contact with others and could have infected those, it could lift the rest of the population out of this lockdown, which is not just um, good for the health, but for the economy of the nation, which has a very strong knock-on effect to the health of the nation. And this economic catastrophe we're going through will also impact the health of the UK. So in our hackathon, we literally made a privacy preserving app that dealt with this. Um, it was followed, we even called it, well, I didn't build it, but a team did. It was called the Traffic Lights app. Um, it followed that traffic light idea they had in China, but the, the crucial difference was in integrating the, the flows of data, it ended up putting them in to um, one of these personal data accounts, such the data held an inference and your risk score. It simply gave the inference out. It didn't give the core data itself. So people's privacy were protected whilst also having a good, functionally useful traffic light thing, which was useful for public health purposes. There are ways of um, giving people digital identity that uh, you know, doesn't necessarily mean massive state involvement in their lives. Okay, uh, great. Thank you for that, James. Um, I think I am going to uh, draw things to a close now, if uh, that's okay. Um, uh, Desiree, were you trying to indicate that you might, uh, uh, about the blockchain meeting? Oh yeah, um, the APPT uh, blockchain that my colleague um, manages has um, a meeting on digital identity on Wednesday. I think on uh, at 5.30, maybe Fernando, you want to tell yourself? Okay, I think it's on 5.30, but we also send out um, invitations for that one. But there might be of interest to many here. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm sure it will be of interest to some. So, right, I am going to draw things to a close now. And of course, I want to, you know, I think it's been a, a fascinating uh, discussion. We all knew that AI would have a, uh, a huge role in predicting and tackling COVID-19. It comes as no surprise, but then of course you start to dig deeper into what are some of the challenges around doing that. And of course it always comes back to the right balance between data and data privacy and sharing of data and who should have access to that and how much are we willing to give our data over. One of the themes of the group has been uh, that people are readily you know, click the user agreement when they download a new app from their phone without necessarily reading it. Uh, and yet when we're asking them to share their data, which may help uh, tackle some of these really serious issues, there's often some reluctance uh, to do so. But this is a, a start of a, a discussion uh, rather than the end, but I think we've got some great uh, starting points. I think what we should do as an APPG is pull out some of those where the government needs to act swiftly and perhaps uh, get a letter. Uh, I'm sure Tim will agree with this wherever he is. I certainly uh, do. To the relevant uh, department because it does sound like there needs to be more uh, joined up discussion between government and the AI uh, community. Now, to be fair to the government, this has taken a lot of resource uh, across the whole of government, but we now need to start pushing forward what we do next rather than firefighting now. So uh, thank you for exploring those themes with us. So to uh, Tim who's left us unfortunately, but to Chris, Shannon, Richard, James and Adam, thank you so much for your contribution. Uh, it's been absolutely fantastic. Thank you to everyone who was uh, online at any point and listening in and of course to uh, Desiree and the Big Innovation Centre for all their work in pulling this together. So that draws it to a close. Myself and uh, Tim are going to, Tim Clement-Jones, Lord Clement-Jones, uh, Desiree and Bagita are gonna stay online uh, as we have to do a little bit of a, a wash up. But if I encourage the rest of you to uh, leave the meeting now and um, look forward to you joining us again at the next one. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.